Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, good morning again. My name is Andrew. I'm the uh, moderator for Track 4. Today, we are very privileged to have uh, three very distinguished colleagues here, Dr. Manish, Prof Tan, as well as Prof Jared Chua, uh, who will be sharing with us about their thoughts and experience about extracorporeal blood purification therapies. This track is sponsored by Fresenius uh, Medical Care, with more than three decades of experience in dialysis and innovative research. Uh, Fresenius leads by enhancing therapy portfolio to treat patients suffering from acute renal failure. Guided by scientific uh, studies, we are they are committed to fully integrating citrate anticoagulation into CRIT therapies, ensuring individual th uh, treatment is safe, easy to control, with heparin anticoagulation treatments available at all times. So I would like to introduce our three distinguished speakers today. First off, we have Prof Tan, who is a, a nephrologist from, um, uh, from the Singapore General Hospital. His current professional state uh, interest is in the field of critical care nephrology, blood purification, acute renal replacement therapy, artificial liver support, and cytokine immunomodulation in severe sepsis. He set up the Mass Liver Dialysis uh, Program in SGH, and is now a stand which has now become the standard of care among the ICUs at SGH, for available for all critically ill patients when indicated. We also have Dr. Manish, also from SGH, who is also uh, working together with Prof Tan in the same department. He had a HMDP scholarship for one year, training in critical care nephrology and cardiorenal syndromes at the International Renal Research Institute, San Bortolo uh, Hospital in Secca, Italy, under the supervision of Professor Claudia Ronco. He currently has been actively involved in teaching at all levels and holds the position of an adjunct assistant professor with, the Dukes, uh, with Duke's National University Singapore Graduate Medical School. In addition, we have uh, Prof. Gerard Chua, who is also the Vice Chairman, Medical Board of Clinical Education in Jurong Health Campus. He's a senior consultant in internal medicine, respiratory medicine, and intensive care medicine. He currently is, uh, his main inter uh, interest is in integration of care for COPD patients, spanning primary, specialty care, intensive care, and palliative care. So without further ado, I would like to begin uh, this session. So Prof Tan, I think uh, we were very curious about uh, immunomodulation in sepsis. Could, maybe could we share your thoughts a little bit about uh, this and how does it relate to extracorporeal uh, blood therapies? Okay. Um, do you want to see my slide now? Yes, that would be good. Can you see my slide? Uh, yes, we can, Prof. Okay, right. Um, I just thought of um, starting off with some preliminary comments to enable our participants to rationalize and understand this uh, emerging field, evolving field, which is somewhat complicated if you are new to this area. So I've been looking at this area for several years and um, my personal bias is towards it. Okay, that I think that it can play an important role in selected patients. Um, but perhaps I would like to say some preliminary comments for some of the participants who might come from a unit that doesn't do this, or maybe thinking of, of introducing this uh, aspect of uh, device treatment to their particular uh, area of practice. So the first thing is you need to understand there are many devices um, uh, out there, some with, with a, a better track record, some with um, just very scanty information. So oftentimes we are, you know, um, um, approached by, by, by industry that, you know, that a particular product is good and all that. So as, as doctors, we need to have an independent mindset and assess how does this new product or emerging product or device uh, fit into our overall practice. So depending on your area of work, uh, perhaps we could start by, by looking at device and system compatibility in the sense that uh, if you are committed to a particular brand, okay, of uh, maybe a CRRT machine and a particular device comes along, you need to ask yourself whether that device is compatible or not. If you can't even get it to uh, work together in a smooth and integrated fashion, then this therapy becomes a problem to implement. Then of course, 
at the nitty gritty level, there's the connectology concerns because obviously industry have different standards of of, of, of tubing, material, uh, diameter, etc. So connectology can become an issue. Uh, so we need to make sure that that is uh, is, uh, is is harmonized. And then of course you need to look at your local existing uh, technical uh, bio bio engineering support, your nursing expertise. Are the nurses um, confident and um, um, are they okay with handling this new therapy that you're trying to introduce into your unit? And, and then, of course, sometimes um, we also need to look at ourselves, whether we are trying to do too much and maybe increase the cost of healthcare without real um, benefit. And as doctors, we often look to uh, in national literature to see whether a particular treatment that we're going to offer is going to be uh, worthwhile or not, because we're going to add on to the cost. The resource constraints are a real problem uh, in many countries as well. Now, the, the thing about blood purification is that the basic concept is that we want to clear um, solutes, metabolites, toxins from the blood compartment. Uh, and by so doing, we try and get the patient out of a vicious cycle. I, I always believe in this uh, line of no return. Once you cross the red line, no matter how much uh, therapy you're going to uh, unleash on your patients, um, the outcome is usually uh, uh, downhill. So we need, but unfortunately, it's very hard to identify what this line of no return is, right? So if a patient has, for example, um, uh, languished for a long time in the ward and has acquired a lot of nosocomial infections, then those kind of patients may not be the best patients to respond to whatever blood purification strategy that you have. And also bear in mind that just because you remove a particular mediator doesn't mean that the patient's organs going to recover, the patient is going to have good outcomes. Sometimes the disease mediators might be well controlled, especially if they are measurable. Um, but that doesn't mean that the outcome is always good. So that's what I mean by the clinical response and mediator control may not move in the same direction. And we need to be cognizant of this limitation. Now, the other thing is that the quality of data out there is quite variable, ranging from case reports to um, small case series to national registries, and of course, ultimately to randomized controlled trials. And unfortunately, in the evolution of some of these therapies, we have had initial excitement, hope, and then only um, to be dashed when the RCTs were performed, and only once but twice, and then we, we find that the practice of those devices become less popular. So there was a case in point being mass liver dialysis. I mean, I was a uh, participant in the early euphoric days when people were all talking about what mass was, could, could do for our critically ill patients. But subsequently, as more and more data were accrued and randomized control trials came out, then of course the enthusiasm somewhat fizzled out. But, but there were other reasons for why perhaps that might not be uh, so popular nowadays. So most of the devices that we see nowadays, they go through this uh, rise and fall, if you like. So we might, and depending on where you read the, the literature in your career, you might may or may not be convinced that it works or not. Now, the other thing that I like to address is whether uh, survival is the only measure uh, to demand from blood purification. In other words, if you were to throw in blood, blood purification plus standard treatment versus standard ICU treatment alone, and the survival is only as good as the standard arm, does it mean that your, your blood purification uh, is, is, is of no benefit with added costs? Uh, and, and this is something controversial because some of us, we really believe in randomized controlled trials to provide us with direction. On the other hand, uh, for my personal bias, I feel that, you know, every patient is unique, it's different. We can't really extrapolate RCT data to our individual patient at a local level. And you really need to customize your therapy based on the patient's comorbidity, background situation, patient expectation, and all the rest of it. So RCTs are provide a guide. Um, at least to tell us that it's not dangerous. Uh, and of course, if it is dangerous, then of course the uh, device would be uh, pulled from the market, right? Now, oh, then the other uh, added complexity is, you know, nowadays we have things like um, uh, adsorption using solvents, using columns, adsorption using membrane. And I remember back in the, in the heady days of uh, high volume hemofiltration, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if some of you recall, but HVHF or pulse sepsis dose high volume hemofiltration experienced a very exciting early phase in which 
biological benefit was unequivocally demonstrated in animals, in early human studies, and only to succumb when the RCTs came out. But I remember those, those exciting days where, where people said that, you know, if you do six to 10 liters of, of effluent outflow, you can actually moderate the systemic cytokine level. And we can even bring down the, the dose or not of, 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 of depressant uh, drugs uh, as a surrogate for the sepsis and septic shock getting better. So those were very exciting times. But again, over the last 20, 30 years, he has uh, fallen out of favor uh, because of the, of the RCTs that came out. And, and not only that, because it is actually a very dangerous treatment, trying to do four to 10 liters an hour uh, is extremely dangerous and not to be recommended. So following that, the interest in the world went into perhaps something more gentle, slow, and safe in the form of solvents, either solvents in the colon or in terms of adsorptive membranes, um, yeah, and the like. So perhaps adsorption is the way to go. How, however, obviously, depending on the size of the adsorptive surface area, um, the capacity for adsorption could be limited depending on what kind of device you're talking about. Now, in the AKI world, we have had uh, 20 to 30 years of lead time to, uh, to answer some of the crucial questions on the ground. For example, what is the dose of, uh, of, 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 of renal support that we need to provide our AKI patients? Uh, how soon should we uh, start uh, RRT in our AKI patients? All those, uh, all, all those questions have been answered in the last 20 over years. However, in an analogous way for blood purification in sepsis, these questions have uh, woefully not been addressed much, partly because there's a diversity of devices out there and it's going to be hard to mount um, this kind of RCT to try and answer the question of, where, of where, when to use it, what dose to use it, and whether it works, of course, in terms of, of survival and organ recovery. So such questions are very challenging to answer and you really need a multinational effort to, uh, to get a sense of, of what the truth is. So in the absence of such um, rigorous data, uh, we practitioners are left to our own clinical um, uh, acumen to try and see whether a particular intervention actually uh, makes the patient uh, better or not at the individual level. But obviously, much more needs to be done on a larger scale internationally. So, and above all, I must say that um, you need to understand that some of these devices are not really totally innocuous. They can cause uh, harm, um, bleeding, anaphylaxis, thrombocytopenia, etc. And we must be cognizant that the devices are, must be monitored and patients be monitored carefully for any side effects. So uh, if, if, you, if you can't do good, above all, do no harm. That's my personal mantra. Okay, I think those are my comments for now. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. So I guess leading to this, since we understand about all the cytokine uh, release and trying to actually clear all these issues, so we want to talk a little bit about extracorporeal blood therapies. Dr. Manish, do you have any comments about that, actually? Yeah, so as uh, like Prof Tan has uh, pointed out, uh, there, may, there is still some interest in trying to figure out what would probably be the best way to, to remove. And so if we just address the question, leaving everything aside that do we have at this point in time um, mechanisms or techniques by which we can remove uh, some of these mediators of disease, uh, then uh, the, the answer to, to that would probably be yes. And I think this is one of those uh, points where the industry is probably a step ahead in the sense that they have given us the tools and the techniques and now it is up to us to try and figure out how best to use them. And uh, once we've, and, and of course, whether they are actually useful or not. So I, I think if I can share my screen, I have just one slide that, uh, mm -hmm. that I would like to summarize and give an overview of the various techniques that are available to us uh, in, in the current scenario, uh, where we can perform the various uh, extracorporeal therapies. Right, so in this uh, slide, I've tried to summarize the, the, various, uh, the, the various techniques that are available to us. So if, say, we do decide uh, in, in the balance of things that we want to proceed um, with trying to immunomodulate the, uh, the disease process and we want to 
remove uh, some of the mediators of disease. Uh, the, the, the basic techniques available are essentially can be divided into two large categories. Where one where we process the whole blood on, on a whole by, uh, by different techniques. The, the, the second part also can be that because we know that all these mediators are dissolved or are so, uh, dissolved in the plasma component. And uh, when we process the whole blood, we of course uh, are faced with the challenges of processing the, the cellular component of the blood as, uh, as well. There are some techniques that uh, have uh, kind of leverage on the flat fact that uh, plasma being devoid of its cellular element and where all the mediators are actually dissolve, we can uh, try and process just the plasma alone. So in, in the next couple of minutes, I will try to go through uh, these various techniques. Now, before we understand this, when we come to blood purification, there are essentially three major transport mechanisms that we have accessible to us to, to try and remove or separate uh, uh, stuff from the blood. And they can be basically divided as uh, diffusion, which is based on a concentration gradient principle. Convection is wherein uh, we use uh, basically kind of washing off everything across a sieve or a filter and adsorption like Prof Tan had mentioned wherein we basically get the mediators to stick to their various uh, to to uh, to stick to the various um, surfaces uh, so when we when we want to process whole blood then again depending on what technique we have what resources we have available to us we can process this into two major ways so uh, in the beginning from the very early days and in a lot of uh, uh, centers even now, uh, CRRT machines or CKRT machines, if, if people have, have uh, accepted the change in terminology uh, from the KTGO side, uh, well, most of us have certain CRRT platforms available to us. And uh, coming with the CRRT platforms would be certain uh, filters or hemo filters that we would use. And uh, there is a way that we can leverage on this technology of CRRT to help um, uh, to, to help uh, immunomodulate or clear some of the mediators of toxins. So the, from the early days of CRT, convection has been a, a, a method of clearing and diffusion when we add in a certain dialysis dose. But we know diffusion may not be the best uh, uh, clearance modality from uh, for, 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 the, for the clearance of middle molecules where most of our cytokines and mediators are in the, in the molecular weight range of about uh, 17 uh, kilodaltons to about 60 kilodaltons. They are generally in that kind of range and they may not be very cleared with diffusion. But part of this was circumvented by the, by the advent of what we call the high cutoff membranes, which wherein the molecular weight cutoff of these membranes can range anywhere from 40 to 65 or kilo, uh, kilo dollars, just below the range of albumin. And then that would allow diffusion to, to become a viable transport mechanism or a clearance mechanism for this. And uh, some of these uh, membranes have been, uh, have been studied for the process of immunomodulation in what we call high cutoff membrane uh, CVBHD. Now convection, as we know from, from the past, is, is a very uh, good mechanism to, to clear middle molecules. And then depending on the volume that we convect across, uh, it, it uh, kind of directly relates into the amount of middle molecules that we can clear. And uh, like Prof Tan had earlier mentioned that in the very early days, uh, to, to have a significant or a meaningful clearance, we needed to generate very high volumes of convection to, to have an impact onto the solute or onto the, onto the mediator clearance because lower volumes probably did not contribute enough to the clearance that would help us to immunomodulate. And therefore the conventional CRRT techniques wherein we generally uh, want to deliver a dose of in the range of 20 to 25 ml per kilogram per hour of total effluent dose uh, for, for the purpose of immunomodulation or clearance of mediators, we may need to use techniques like what we call as high volume hemofiltration or very high volume hemofiltration. Now, the, the way uh, or the definition of high volume hemofiltration mm -hmm. is basically when your convective dose of the total effluent dose that you deliver, your, the convective dose is in the range of 35 to 45 mils per kilogram per hour. And in very high volume hemofiltration, the convective dose of the total effluent dose is more than 45 mils per kilogram per hour. 
which would mean that if you're doing a modality like HDF, your total effluent dose may be 50, 60, 70 mils per kilogram per hour. Right. So, so this is a technique uh, that has been used and various trials have, have been published on, on these techniques, which I'm uh, sure Jaro will be speaking about a little bit later. Uh, people have also used high uh, cutoff membranes to, to in, uh, in, in the convective modality, but this then of course gets a little bit limited by, uh, by, by the loss of albumin uh, that may happen with these membranes. And beyond convective volumes or total volumes of about three liters an hour, there's not much difference between a high cutoff CVVHD and a high cutoff CVVH. Uh, in, in terms of the mediator clearance, but of course the albumin clearance is more with CVVH modality. And therefore, when with high volumes, uh, people may prefer to use the high uh, cutoff membranes for CVVHD. Now, the other things that as the technology has advanced, we have uh, certain membranes that have come up that may help or that, that have a, an extra adsorptive capacity in addition to their diffusion and, and convection uh, mediated clearance. And some of these membranes uh, we have I've been highlighted, the PMMA membrane, the AN69 membrane, and the, the PIPA, which is, the, which is basically a polyester uh, uh, polymer alloy membranes, which are different membranes. And, uh, and in some membranes, this structure has been modified a little bit to, uh, to increase their adsorptive capacity for both uh, cytokines and endotoxins and uh, kind of help in, in, in the clearance of these mediators. So this is basically the, the advantage of the techniques that I've described thus far is that these can be done with the regular CRRT machine and, and the, and the, and, and the uh, hardware and the software are, uh, available. The other mechanism wherein we basically uh, invoke adsorption as a, as a mechanism of clearance um, uh, and which Prof Tan has alluded to that maybe is, is, the, is the mechanism of clearance that we may be looking at into the future would be where we perfuse the whole blood per se through a column uh, which has either fibers inside or it has um, a kind of microporous polystyrene beads inside uh, which can help us to absorb these mediators. And of the various uh, 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 things available in, in, the, in the market, uh, they can be broadly divided into what we call non-selective cartridges, which will remove cytokines and, and a lot of other mediators uh, and other substances uh, which are less than the molecular weight removal. So, so for example, in, this, in the cytosol cartridge, they generally have a cutoff of about 60 kilodalton. So they will remove very well cytokines and uh, myoglobin, <clears throat> bilirubin, and other mediators of, say, liver failure, etc. But cytosol may not be a good cartridge to, to remove uh, endotoxins because endotoxins have a molecular weight of more than 100 kilodalton. So it may not be selective for that. On the other hand, there are certain selective cartridges that are accessible to us. Um, and the, uh, the one which uh, Prof Tan uh, has had experience and, and, and because of him, I've had the uh, chance of uh, observing uh, is the polymyxin B, which is basically a polymyxin antibiotic, which is covalently linked uh, onto the poly, uh, onto the fibers, uh, and and by by virtue of the fact that the polymyxin can bind with the lipopolysaccharides, it is a bit selective in its removal, and it is uh, selective in removal of endotoxins, and therefore can be used. In, uh, uh, in gram-negative sepsis. The example of other select, uh, cartridges like the lipopolysaccharide uh, or the METIS from the FMC, FMC system has been here as well, but uh, I have no personal experience with, with these. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, that there, there would be challenges when we are dealing directly with the blood because along when we deal with whole blood, we also have, uh, have cells and, and albumin, et cetera. And, and as these blood perfuse through these cartridges and because of the, 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 the linear velocity that we have to invoke to move the blood across and generally the blood flows are anywhere about 150 to 200 ml per minute, um, they, they, the, the cellular elements may actually cause a little bit of fouling along the cartridges. And, uh, and, and there could be entrapment of the cells that may happen in the fibers or along the beads, or there may be a bit of drop in platelets and they may contribute a little bit to, to some of the undesired effects of these. 
So what what people then uh, thought the another way to do it would be that we we first process the whole blood and we pass this whole blood through a plasma filter, which has a very large uh, pore size of about 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.2 uh, or more uh, or 0 0.3 micrometer. And, uh, and by doing that, they separate the cellular component of the blood and the plasma component of the blood. And once the plasma component of the blood gets separated and with it in, in it all its dissolved uh, mediators and albumin and immunoglobins, et cetera, then this plasma is then processed in, by, different, by different ways. And, and the most common uh, uh, processing mechanism that has been discussed in the literature is what we call coupled plasma filtration and absorption or CPFA, wherein the, the separated plasma is then <laughs> To a sorbent cartridge, which has some polystyrene beads uh, or, 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 or synthetic beads, and uh, wherein it will adsorb the mediators along with it. And once this kind of cleansed plasma that has been removed of its mediator joins back into the bloodline, and then this bloodline then passes through a conventional CRRT hemofilter to undergo uh, CRRT uh, or uh, to undergo. Uh, blood purification for its eudemic toxins and for acid-base control and electrolyte control before the circuit uh, before the blood is returned to the patient, right? And uh, so th that is one way of processing. And then of course the the, the sorbent column can be different, and then there, there will be different companies that manufacture or use different uh, uh, components in the sorbent column to to selectively remove what they want to remove. The other thing that there is, uh, there is some literature out in is, is where we just exchange the whole plasma. We, we separate the plasma and we discard the separated plasma along with all of the mediators that we want to remove. And then this discarded plasma is then replaced by an equivalent volume of, uh, of plasma and, and a bit of 5% albumin to, to kind of uh, replete the volume uh, that is in the blood and uh, in the in the circulation, and uh, along and then of course along with that it clears a lot of the inflammatory mediators. But needless to say that when we are clearing the whole plasma, in addition to to everything else, we are also removing uh, the good and the bad stuff simultaneously, and then we have to bear that in mind. So the the common uh, the these are the common mechanisms that are invoked for 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 immunomediator clearance. And uh, based on these various mechanisms, there are various techniques that have been studied in case reports, in case series, and in randomized trials, uh, which will be discussed later. And there are some experimental techniques that are being probably used at the experiment or animal level with very, very early or preliminary uh, preliminary data on, on human study. So one is the CIRAF 100 microbiome affinity filter, which basically binds pathogens per se. So in, in these techniques that I'm describing, we are not trying to immunomodulate by removal of mediators. We are trying, we are going one level upstream and trying to remove the, the, the pathogens or the, the, uh, the, the, the viruses uh, upstream and so that we don't inside an immune or, or a dysregulated immune system. So uh, this binds the viruses and bacteria. And then uh, the people have used the mannose uh, binding uh, lectin with, uh, with, with its, uh, uh, to, to bind on the polysulfone membranes to again bind the circulating pathogens. Uh, the hemopurifier, which is a lectin affinity plasma pheresis device that removes viruses. And this, this uh, was actually used in human beings during the Ebola virus and there was some uh, publication in terms of case reports. And then of course we have some renal assist devices and selective cytopheresis devices, but these are very early and personally I don't have, or I have not seen any one of these, but I just put this for the completeness of, of the thing. So uh, this is just a quick uh, thing that was added on a little bit later. These are the general circuit diagrams that we use. So the, the first one, as you can see, this is a general CRRT circuit where we, we have blood flowing and then we have our usual uh, CRRT high flux hemofilter. And then we just generate very high convective volumes uh, to, to eliminate the mediator toxins. So this is very easily accessible to us. Then similarly, when we replace these high cutoff filters, uh, 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 when we replace these high flux hemofilters with specific 
membranes, which we call the high cutoff membranes, which have a cutoff of more than 40 to 65 kilodaltons or by, by defending, I mean, these are the commercially available ones. They are generally in this kind of range. Uh, we can do the same thing as here, but because of the high cutoff, we also have to be cognizant regarding their albumin loss uh, in these membranes. The third is direct hemoperfusion, wherein you just uh, uh, access uh, the blood from the patient and then flow it through, through your sorbent cartridge, which could be depending on the cartridge that is available that you could use, and you could just flow it direct. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the cleansed blood, so to speak, will be returned into the patients. There is also a possibility of integrating this cartridge into a regular CRT circuit. So you could do it in a series parallel connection, wherein you put it as a shunt circuit in this, and you can do both the therapies simultaneously. And this is the CPFA therapy wherein you access blood from the patients, you, uh, you uh, separate the plasma from the blood, uh, and generally you, for, for all the plasma blood flow there, we generally separate or, or uh, extract plasma at about uh, 10 to 20% of the blood flow rate. And that plasma is then flown, or uh, is, is uh, perfused through a sorbent cartridge wherein the mediators are removed and it joins back into the bloodline. And then this bloodline then flows through a conventional hemofilter before it is returned back into the patient, right? And uh, yeah, so I think uh, this, is, this is just a synopsis of the various techniques that I, I have uh, shared with you. And uh, I will be happy to, to take any questions and pass on. Thank you so much, Dr. Manish. I think it's very interesting to see that uh, extracorporal blood therapies actually has a wide range and I think it's something that not all of us are very experienced with. But uh, having seen so much, right, is, do we know what's the evidence behind each of the modalities or what is better than the other or in what study population would this be better suited? Maybe, Prof. Jared, could I ask you to share with us a little bit about the evidence behind these therapies? Okay, uh, thanks, Andrew. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. Um, and hang on. The slides on? Yes, the slides are on. Okay, so I uh, for this talk, I have uh, looked through all the the published literature of uh, EBCT, uh, and uh, hence this is now the real world beyond uh, what is theoretically possible. Okay, so I, I've uh, decided chosen to classify the published literature into these uh, six modalities, all of which uh, the two speakers, uh, two previous speakers have touched on already actually, right? But we, we start with uh, polymyxin B hemo uh, perfusion, right? And I choose to start here uh, only because uh, to date, uh, this trial, which is called the Euphrates, is the largest trial of any form of blood purification modality uh, that has been published outside of conventional CRT for AKI and sepsis, right? So, so this was a trial which compared polymyxin B hemoperfusion versus uh, controls on sham circuits. It, um, it involved um, 55 centers in North America and it ran uh, for a, a rather long time, right? 2010 to 2016, right? They, they, um, and wrote patients to septic shock. In addition, uh, they did what is known as an endotoxin activity assay. And uh, to be enrolled, you needed a level of greater than 0 0.6, right? So endotoxin uh, usually associated with gram-negative sepsis. Um, the treatment arm would entail uh, 120 minute uh, hemoperfusion treatments. Uh, two such treatments uh, within 24 hours of each other. Right? And on the right uh, is a circuit diagram. The blood flow would be a gentle 100 mils per minute, uh, anticoagulation using IV heparin mostly. Uh, so the target sample size when it was first set up was 360. Right? Uh, for EBCT, this is actually uh, a large uh, number. And it was powered to detect a 15% absolute risk reduction in 28-day mortal mortality uh, with the assumption that the event rate in controls would be about 35%. Okay, as it turns out, uh, 
during the second interim analysis, uh, they decided to exclude uh, patients with uh, a low MOT score of uh, of anything less than 10, right? So because of that uh, protocol change, they needed to increase their sample size to 450. Uh, but again, as it turns out, um, in the end, if you just considered patients uh, with MOT score uh, 10 to 24, the maximum, this was essentially a comparison of uh, 146 uh, on treatment versus 148 on uh, controls. Lah. And uh, the results are summarized in the slide. Uh, this is one of those uh, trials where initially lots of uh, anticipation uh, of a positive result, but in the end, um, no, no positive signal of uh, benefit. Whether, I mean, if you just analyze those above MOTS uh, 10, 10 and above, and even if we um, conclude, use just the the per protocol patients again, uh, no benefit, right? But uh, so that that trial was actually published in October of 2018. The very next month, right, in ICM uh, uh, was published a uh, exploratory uh, post hoc analysis of the Euphrates data set, right? And this uh, data set comprised 104 patients. Uh, so they were the sick ones, mods greater than. Uh, nine, uh, but the, these patients uh, completed uh, two treatments according to protocol and had an EA um, level of between 0 0.6, which is the minimum that uh, to qualify, but not exceeding 0 0.89, right? Anything in excess of 0 0.89, these authors considered as uh, extreme uh, endotoxemia and it turns out that uh, if we analyze, uh, if we excluded those with ex this extreme uh, endotoxemia from the 28-day mortality analysis, there was a signal of benefits, right? Um, control group mortality, 36%, treatment group, uh, 26%, uh, absolute risk reduction of about 11 Okay, but again, uh, as we all know, the, according to the rules of uh, evidence-based medicine, such a subgroup analysis would at best be hypothesis generating, right? So in order to validate this result, guess what, right? So they have devised another trial, right? Named after the other great river in uh, Iraq called the Tigris. Right? So this uh, also a phase approved uh, phase three trial uh, was actually approved as an amendment to the Euphrates protocol, right? And now uh, what the, they are planning to do is to add this new data uh, to the Euphrates data, right? Um, 150 patients of which 100 will be on PMX, 50 on control. They will only allow experience centers now to, to contribute. Uh, presumably these experience centers will have a higher chance of getting, bringing patients to protocol completion, right? And, uh, uh, as per modified uh, um, Euphrates mods uh, must be more than nine. And now they would restrict the EA level to between 0 0.6 to 0 0.89, right? So excluding those with extreme uh, endotoxemia. Okay, so this, I uh, believe this trial uh, uh, started recruiting uh, this time last year. Uh, and expect is expected to go on to September 2022, but uh, with the events of this year, it may very well need to be prolonged, right? But this, uh, in a way, concludes the the chapter on uh, polymixin B hemoperfusion, right? So next, uh, we look at the, the 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 literature on the highly adsorptive uh, membranes or columns, right? And and first up, we have uh, the oxyris. Um, membrane. So this is actually a EN69 uh, membrane, which I think most of us uh, would have had some experience with. And then uh, layered on top of that is a layer of, of uh, positive charges, which apparently can bind endotoxin. And then layered on top of that is the third layer of uh, heparin, graft, uh, heparin uh, molecules grafted in. Right. So the combination of these uh, three layers is uh, thought to be beneficial. Right in blood for blood purification and sepsis, 
And, and so what actually is in the literature? Um, I, I looked very hard and this uh, French study seems to be the largest one that we have, right? So this was a, a French study from two French ICUs. Uh, they recruited from 14 to 19. Uh, and uh, it was uh, 31 patients, not very big, uh, 31 patients, uh, 42 sessions. And so this uh, is just a, a single cohort, no control group. Um, and uh, the characteristics of these uh, 31 patients undergoing 42 sessions is uh, shown on the right of the screen. And what they seem to, their results seem to suggest is that there was a significant mortality difference between the observed mortality and the predicted mortality, right? But uh, only with uh, patients uh, with a SAP score greater than uh, 74, in which the predicted mortality was in excess of 88%, right? So perhaps some signal of benefit for the sickest of patients, uh, but obviously the problem with this study is that it's uh, there's got no control group right so it um, it uh, it is not definitive in itself also in the literature um, uh, or rather on clinical trials uh, uh, dot org, I found this uh, Swedish study a very small uh, 16 participants it has apparently been completed in January 18 uh, no published results so I'm not sure whether that uh, implies anything. I also found this Swiss study, a little bit larger, 38 patients completed July last year, also couldn't find any published results. Um, but, you know, maybe the, the Europeans have their hands full this year, no time really to get down to writing things up. But anyway, these are studies on the exarius membrane which have been completed, uh, but have not been published. And there's a ongoing uh, French study uh, 40 participants uh, due to complete next year, All right? So this, this is what we have for Osiris. Uh, interestingly, uh, the events of uh, 2020 uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic um, made the US FDA issue uh, emergency use authorization, EUA, in April this year for the use of the Osiris. Right, to treat uh, critically ill uh, COVID-19 patients, right? And uh, the, 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 uh, to qualify for its intended use, you must have uh, severe lung manifestations and, uh, and or multi-organ failure, right? So as what I'll show you shortly, the Osiris membrane is one of four devices in which the FDA uh, issued this uh, EUA. Moving on next uh, to the other uh, heme adsorption uh, device, this is the cytosorb. So while the auxiris is a membrane, the cytosorb is, um, is a column of beads, uh, porous uh, polymeric beads capable of uh, adsorbing and removing cytokines and other uh, uh, middle molecular weight uh, toxins by surface adsorption, right? So, and uh, the, the diagram on the right is supposed to be able to bind a uh, lot of uh, evil stuff. But in addition, uh, it might bind antibiotics and drugs. So, you know, double H sword, I think we, we need to regard this. So the, the published literature on the cytosorb, I found this uh, phase two open label RCT conducted by the Germans. Uh, some time ago now, actually, um, although published in 2017, uh, they had recruited from 2008 to 2011. And the primary outcome uh, was not mortality. They, they just wanted to show whether it could reduce uh, the plasma IL-6, right? And we know IL-6 uh, seems to be a rather evil mediator in the COVID uh, situation. But anyway, this was what these uh, German investigators uh, wanted to show. Uh, they randomized 100 patients to uh, the treatment arm, which involved uh, the cytosorb, either alone or in series uh, with a CRT circuit, right? And this was uh, six hours of treatment a day up to seven days, okay? So bear in mind, this only six hours, one quarter of the day. Okay, versus uh, standard treatment. Unfortunately, 
right? What they set out to show a, a decrease in IL six uh, uh, didn't bear out. Okay, uh, everybody started off around the five hundred picogram uh, level, and uh, and then decreased over the week, but uh, no difference whether you were on the cytosol or not. An obvious uh, limitation for this protocol was uh, it was only six hours of every twenty four a day. So uh, may not have been just like, you know, when prone position was first used, um, you know, just uh, a fraction of the day um, didn't show benefit. Only when we ex extended use uh, did we succeed in showing its benefit. So perhaps this was the problems with the initial cytosol uh, protocols. La. I think learning from uh, this initial uh, uh, non-success uh, there's another German group uh, are doing an open label RCT and they are recruiting patients uh, in septic shock. In addition, uh, these patients would have a very high IL-6 level to begin with, 1,000 picograms. And, and, uh, and these patients would be in need of CRT, so the cytosol would be not used in isolation, but in series with the CRT circuit. And, and uh, uh, apparently, uh, this uh, group based out of uh, Hamburg started recruitment uh, in January this year, right? But uh, I think the events of the year overtook it. Uh, and so the same group uh, from Hamburg is in April this year decided to conduct another uh, uh, parallel study, open, lab only open label RCT, this time in patients with COVID-19, right? Uh, uh, which with virtually the same inclusion criteria. So th this is what's uh, happening in Germany. Um, and just like uh, Oxiris, the Cytosop has also been uh, issued the EUA by the US FDA for the same uh, indications. Uh, the, the EUA states that uh, on day one, the, you need to use uh, two, two cartridges. That means you change one, at, uh, change at cartridge at 12 hours and 24. And then after that, day two, day three, one cartridge a day, right? So this is uh, um, different from the initial uh, German pilot study. And um, it can be used uh, by itself in conjunction with CRT or even in conjunction with ECMO, right? So this is uh, being used uh, in, uh, in uh, exceptional circumstances of this year in the United States. Um, okay, so uh, there is a registry um, in the United States uh, which hopes to capture the prospectively uh, the experience in the first 500 patients. So this is the cytosol registry for COVID-19 in the in the US. Um, and across the Atlantic uh, in Europe, uh, there's also what I believe to be fairly keen interest in this technique. Uh, so the Belgians are also conducting uh, open label RCT in, uh, in um, intubated uh, COVID patients. Right, as are this uh, uh, group in uh, Germany also, not the same group uh, as we spoke of earlier. The, these are the, the, the uh, Stockmann uh, is uh, based out of uh, Berlin in Germany. So. This is yet another cytosop uh, open label RCT ongoing in Europe, and uh, and uh, another a third German group right from Freiburg is uh, also doing RCT, uh, but these are patients who are on ECMO, so VB ECMO plus cytosop versus uh, conventional VB ECMO, right? So what it seems uh, that quite a lot of interest on both. Uh, sites of the Atlantic uh, for the cytosop use. La. So I, I visited the cytosop uh, website and they claim right that to date, more than 2,800 critically ill patients with COVID-19 infection have been treated with cytosop in 30 countries, right? Uh, obviously it's early days as to whether or not uh, it's going to be of any uh, clinical benefit, right? But, so that's the cytosop story. Since we uh, I've been speaking on the, the US uh, FDA EUA. So uh, they, they issued to four devices, right? So this is the third device. So this is the Seraph 
100 microbine, uh, full name uh, microbine affinity blood filter, right? So, so this blood filter was actually designed to just filter off blood-borne pathogens, right? And um, there are in vivo studies in which is, can uh, remove bacteria, Gramnex, uh, Staph, Enterococcus, also Candida, and some uh, evidence to suggest it can also remove uh, HSV, CMV, and Ebola. Right? I think it, it was primarily used device uh, uh, designed to be a non-antibiotic alternative for treating pan-resistant bacteremias. Okay, it's a, a, a invention from a, a collaboration between a life science incubator in California and the Karolinska Institute of Stockholm. Right, so, um, any evidence uh, of its use so far in, in the published literature? So, this is what I managed to find, right? So, uh, the Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, which covers the White House, uh, published uh, their experience in uh, treating two patients. Of course, uh, embedded in that paper was some uh, in vitro studies which suggested that passing uh, uh, blood laden with uh, the, the COVID-19 virus uh, could reduce uh, the copies uh, before and after, right? So maybe some uh, proof of concept that it could work for a device which was primarily that is designed for use in bacteria, actually. Uh, but uh, these two patients, uh, they, they published what they, they had. Uh, uh, nothing impressive, if you were to ask me. The, the, the first patient had viremia before and after. By the second time uh, he was put on the, the filter, he had no more viremia. And for the second patient, there, there's absolutely, maybe they forgot to, to, to uh, measure. I'm not sure. There's no, no data. So we're not quite really sure whether this uh, is of any, any utility to begin with, but nonetheless, it's mentioned because it is one of th four devices which has had the, the EUA issued. Okay, so next uh, on the list is uh, coupled plasma filtration absorption, CPFA. All right, so uh, CPFA, uh, made its uh, debut uh, in the literature in this uh, publication, 2014. This is the COMPACT trial. Uh, it was uh, run out of uh, 18 uh, Italian, sorry, eight, eight, that's right, eight, 18 uh, Italian ICUs uh, from, from some time ago now, 2007 to 2020. Uh, they had aimed to recruit uh, 330 patients. Um, and, and this was a comparison between CPFA, which would be run for 10 hours a day for five days, uh, aiming to remove a total of 10 liters of plasma. Okay, and the device used was uh, the Belco Linder machine. This is an Italian uh, device. Okay, the, um, it was terminated after about 60% of patients, the targeted uh, recruitment target uh, because of uh, futility. No, absolutely no difference between controls and CPFA treated patients. Of course, uh, one of the problems was that the, apparently 48% of the CPFA patients, uh, uh, only 48% uh, completed treatment as per protocol. And uh, many of these patients who were unable to complete protocol had problems with clotting of the circuit. Right, so CPFA uh, didn't get, get off to a good start, but uh, by the time this study was published in 2014, COMPACT-2 had or was already underway. Okay, they now used a, 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 a newer generation machine, the Belco Ampliler, right? And again, uh, uh, it was mainly uh, ICUs in Italy, same uh, PI, Sergio, Livigny, and this started uh, in 2013. And, and this time uh, they were going after a slightly higher dose of uh, plasma treatment, uh, 0 0.20, which is about 50, 25% higher than, than Compact One. Okay, but alas, right? Alas, uh, this happened in, uh, in uh, 20, October of 2017. 
uh, early closure of the study was uh, was ordered uh, by the Italian uh, ICU uh, uh, research watchdog. Okay, because uh, there was a suggestion of early mortality, right? Uh, controls uh, in the first three days, mortality 12.5, CPFA treated 32. Uh, uh, 32.8, which is apparently uh, statistically significant, right? So then if you followed the survival curves beyond the first three days, also seem to have a, a separation, right? So because of uh, the Compact 2 study, uh, it, it was terminated early right? and uh, within half a year, um, uh, Medtronic Singapore issued this urgent uh, fuel safety notice, right? So this is actually to, Sing uh, to, to Singapore users of the Belco, uh, warning us uh, that uh, it should not be used uh, in septic shock, okay, because of the compact tool studies. Uh, why Medtronic? Uh, because uh, by this time, uh, Met uh, the Belco uh, company in Italy had been acquired by Medtronic. So Medtronic, uh, uh, Kind of like bought over this hot potato, la. right? So anyway, uh, that kind of put the plug on the Belco on um, the Belco and uh, Compact Two studies. The Romper study was uh, an equivalent of the Compact Two in uh, Spanish ICUs. So because of what happened in Compact Two, uh, the Romp uh, the the Spaniards also had to close their trial prematurely, although they claimed that uh, they their uh, data didn't suggest uh, any uh, uh, early uh, harm, but uh, as can be seen in their um, survival curves, perhaps there is some harm as well. But anyway, CPFA seems to have died a premature death. Okay, so moving on to uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. Uh, what do we have in the literature? This uh, pilot study, uh, published in 2018, uh, this was a single center in Hanover, Germany, open label, non-randomized, and uh, they recruited 20 patients with septic shock. And they, uh, for these 20 patients, they underwent a centrifugal uh, therapeutic plasma exchange uh, within six hours of uh, being found suitable. Okay, now 1.2 uh, times plasma volume would be centrifuged out. Um, over a two-hour period. And what they found was that uh, within the two hours of the TPA circuit, uh, there would be the immediate effects of a dose reduction in uh, the noradrenaline support. And this uh, immediate effect was seen in uh, 10 out of 20 of these patients. Okay, And seven out of the 10, seven out of the 20, uh, went on to demonstrate a drop in the SOFA score uh, after two days, right? So uh, some uh, beneficial effects uh, and, and for the early, for the overall mortality observed 65%, but for those seven patients who did manifest a sustained response, uh, their mortality was lower at 43%, right? So Obviously, no control group, so can't, can't uh, be too excited about this, but the reasonable conclusion was that this was, it was safe and feasible to apply TPE in early septic shock. And so, uh, uh, following on from that, uh, the exchange study is now under, uh, underway. Uh, 11 centers in Germany uh, um, started recruitment, apparently in 2016, set to complete next year. Uh, and this would involve uh, TPE, uh, three sessions on three consecutive days. Right, so uh, very unlike the f first one, which just them did uh, one session, two, two hours, and did observation then. Right, so TPE uh, still being studied. A variation of TPE is uh, when it is then coupled with uh, a plasma adsorption column. Right, so this is the, the, the spectra uh, uh, Opture aphoresis system, right? Coupled with uh, a plasma adsorption column called the D two thousand, uh, manufactured by the Swiss uh, 
company called Marker Therapeutics, right? And th and this this uh, combination was also I issued with the US FDA uh, EUA in April, right? So uh, on the circuit diagram, uh, what what is done is that plasma after being a centrifuge out is sent downstream through the D two thousand adsorption column for the removal of the evil mediators, right? And and and, and so the, there is a protocol being studied now, the, the, the OPSHA secondary plasma device protocol, cross, um, single arm, not randomized, five US centers, and they, they've uh, started recruiting, right? And they plan to do one treatment a day uh, for up to four hours uh, and for up to seven days, looking primarily at uh, a 20 day outcome, all cause mortality benefit. Right. So this is the third uh, the, and fourth uh, uh, treatment uh, which received um, FDA uh, uh, urgent uh, um, approval for use. Just to uh, complete uh, the, 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 the story, uh, I'll move on very briefly to high cut of membranes. I think uh, Manish did speak about them. Uh, in the published literature, there is the P2SH uh, membrane. This uh, literature started appearing uh, on this membrane, uh, the high cutoff uh, properties of it um, about 15 years ago. And it apparently has a high cutoff of about 100 kilodaltons. Um, and uh, initially, uh, some enthusiasm after a pilot study published uh, in 2006. Okay, but this recently published study uh, from uh, uh, Belomo's unit in Australia, uh, single center, uh, failed to show any benefits. Right? This was essentially a re reproduction of the, the Berlin study of 2006. Uh, no, no, uh, no signal of benefit. Uh, and may have a signal of uh, of harm, right? So this uh, the the P two SH, I think uh, high cutoff membrane uh, is probably not going to be studied uh, much more after this. That's my suspicion. There's another uh, high cutoff membrane, the Septex, uh, which has which is a little bit more uh, more recent uh, um, entrant on on the, the commercial market. So this prospective study from uh, four Italian ICUs, right? Uh, compared uh, septex membrane uh, versus conventional uh, um, CVH in 69. Uh, again, this uh, is a non-controlled study. So they recruited 38 patients uh, with septic shock AKI. Uh, they underwent this treatment and uh, of the 38 patients, uh, 30 survived, eight didn't. And, uh, and those who did had a rapid improvement in the uh, SOFA score. Obviously, again, not much can be concluded from this because of there's no control group, right? But nonetheless, this is the best in the literature there is at the moment, in my opinion, as far as the septex membrane is concerned. And to complete uh, the story, Right, uh, just uh, uh, my closing comments on the high volume chemofiltration. What Dr. Tan, Professor Tan, uh, described as the heady days, uh, where it was thought that higher was better, right, until the Ivory study came out, right. So the Ivory study put an end to the notion that higher was better. The Ivory study uh, compared high volume hemofiltration, 70 mils per kg per hour versus standard treatment, 35 for 96 hours. And uh, I think uh, after it was published in 2013 uh, with the negative uh, results, I think that really uh, put a dampener on, uh, on uh, that technique, right? So in, in summary, uh, after, after discussing all the trials, I think we have to conclude that uh, despite positive signals from experimental uh, case studies and small uh, um, pilot studies, blood purification techniques have not shown a distinct 
morbidity and mortality benefits, certainly in the large trials. Okay, so that is the, the real world uh, before 2020. In the real world of 2020 with uh, COVID-19 upon us, right, we have seen the US FDA granting uh, emergency use authorization for four uh, devices, right, the Spectra, the Cytosorp, the uh, Seraph Microbine, and the Oxiris um, with uh, not much uh, data, but I guess um, uh, backs uh, to the wall, uh, perhaps particularly in the United States. I tried to see what the Chinese would recommend. I found this. Thankfully, I found a translation as well of, of uh, that same document, um, expert recommendation for blood purification uh, for COVID-19. And the Chinese are a little bit uh, broad and non-specific in their recommendations, right? So uh, they, they, they seem to be recommending uh, for use uh, everything I showed on the slide so previous to this. Lah. Um, and I'll end with uh, perhaps what, the, what do I think the European sentiment is, right? So, uh, so we know uh, the, the region in, Italy, in uh, Europe f first hit uh, badly was uh, uh, Lombardy, Northern Italy, right? So this, uh, the Brescia Renal COVID Task Force uh, came up with uh, this recommendation. Of course, they are renal physicians uh, and the recommendation of this document was primarily for uh, for renal replacement therapy, but they did put in um, uh, a section in which they said that if uh, patients did have get AKI and needed CRT, uh, their suggestion was to couple the circuit with the cytosol. Um, and it could be used uh, even together with uh, IL-6 block, uh, blockade. Right, so I, I think uh, in a nutshell, that is the state of uh, the EBCT in uh, the real world in uh, 2020 and before 2020. Um, and um, I'm happy to uh, take questions from the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Jared. I think that was excellent because I think a lot of us don't have that much experience with uh, EBCT. And I think uh, some of the questions that came up at least right now is, Perhaps the first question I'd like to ask the panel is, why do you think that the, given the theoretical advantages of sepsis immune, immunomodulation, why do you think the trials showed so much difference and it disappointed so, us so much? Is it because we chose wrong outcomes? We see a heterogeneous set of outcomes that we're looking at? Or was it the study population that we are kind of like missing the boat? Um, maybe, maybe I could go first. Um, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a combination of factors. Um, just like uh, ARDS uh, trials, uh, you know, which struggle to, to show uh, benefit. So because ARDS is a, is a very heterogeneous uh, syndrome. So likewise, uh, sepsis induced AKI. Let us put the COVID patients aside now, right? Sepsis induced AKI, uh, uh, very heterogeneous. So, you know, applying uh, one therapy to a heterogeneous group uh, um, uh, may not uh, necessarily bear out the benefit. Now. And of course, there are the technical aspects, right? The, uh, in the pilot studies where, uh, you know, perhaps uh, the, the wrong protocols were used, insufficient duration, and then of course, uh, or when they, they do go to multi-center, large scale uh, uh, trials uh, set up, uh, inexperienced centers uh, will not be able to complete as per protocol, right? Because of clotting and other things. And, and that in a way may also degrade uh, the signal, right? So I think uh, the large phase three RCTs are plagued by this whole host of issues, uh, which then makes the signal very hard to uncover. Uh, Ankim, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I echo your sentiments. Uh, device trials, unlike drug trials, are extremely messy and challenging because of the uh, background noise, if you like, which uh, drowns out the signal we are looking for. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that those therapies um, are, are bad in, in that sense. Huh? So I would also argue that besides uh, survival, we should be looking at more um, intermediate surrogates, like maybe uh, time off, uh, time to extubation or time to uh, pressure reduction, as these can translate into um, real life uh, benefits, like you know, less nosocomial pneumonias, less um, bad effects from the prolonged use of high dose um, uh, pressures. So we we do see some of these uh, intermediate benefits, uh, but of course they don't make the headlines. I think that's a uh, very excellent advice. In, in fact, actually, one of our com uh, one of the audience actually did comment that it's important to look at the time that these studies and recommendations were published, because the recent the, the recent recommendations have been published very early on into the development of the pandemic. I think time has passed. It's about a couple of months already. Have things changed? Do you think that the 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 due to the changes and with the new additional data, is there anything that would have changed in terms of the recommendations? What are your thoughts about that? Are you talking about COVID-19? Uh, yes, in terms of COVID-19 here. Um, I'm not an infectious disease expert, but my sim simplistic take on it is that it is an inflammatory disease and intense inflammation with multi-organ um, damage. So whether you are choosing a, a, a drug approach or device approach, and my bias is towards a, a device approach, so whatever device that you want to use, mm. um, the, the problem is that we do not know how best to use those devices to dampen the, uh, the inflammatory storm. And I think if we, are, if we can get a handle on how to dampen the uh, intense inflammatory storm, we might uh, be able to um, realize some clinical benefit. Like I said, uh, the, the time to pressure reduction, time to off the ventilator and recovery from ARDS. ARDS is a particularly stubborn uh, thing to treat. I mean, we ourselves in our center, we have, uh, I, I think there were a few ICU patients with COVID. Um, in our unpublished observation, we found that um, uh, ventilating these patients were extremely tricky. And um, if we could provide an anti-inflammatory approach, it might be able to uh, contribute towards a better outcome. But our experience is purely anecdotal and we haven't published our observations yet. So I guess someone had asked about how many of these patients uh, required uh, extra corporal therapy among the ICU COVID patients. Uh, is anyone aware of that or does anyone have any experience about that? I, I can just share with you what uh, about at, uh, at SGH. Uh, so when we last uh, discussed this, I think we had uh, 11 in the ICU in total, of which, <clears throat> uh, of which uh, five actually ended up requiring uh, CRRT support, which is about 45%, so almost half, which is kind of similar to the experience, I believe, in many other centers. And of the five uh, that that, uh, that required, 40%, uh, which means two of the five did not, uh, did not go through the ICU admission, and the three of them recovered. And uh, all the three of them, by as, as of now, they have recovered back to their baseline renal function, so they had a complete recovery, and uh, and I would just uh, like to add, and I think uh, Prof Tan can can comment on that uh, later because I think this was one of his uh, his ideas of how to try and mitigate the the, the hyperinflammatory state. So, uh, like has been shown by Gerald uh, at at SGH, we decided from the outset to use uh, the oxiris membrane uh, because I mean this we obviously we were all very new to this disease and we have no idea in uh, on this and so we we decided that we would use and uh, I think uh, uh, Prof Tan had an added uh, limit which I will I will let him to share in a bit and. So for all our patients, we use this membrane, and uh, this is the outcome that we have as of uh, as of date uh, in in our experience. I do not know, or I'm not aware of the total number in Singapore who required ICU stay and the total number of. Uh, Prathan, you want to, to to add in about how you 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 read out the proposal for this? Yeah, I, I think we, we had special permission from the hospital because these were extraordinary times. And normally, auxiliaries is used um, conventionally to prolong circuit longevity. 
Uh, in other words, we use it until it clots. That's the conventional way of using it. But seeing that there were a lot of um, uh, uh, laboratory data on the broad spectrum nature of the auxiliary membrane, having both affinity for uh, endotoxins as well as cytokines, uh, it dawned on us as a group that perhaps we should uh, use auxiliaries in a more unconventional way, perhaps changing it at a predetermined time interval instead of allowing it to clot spontaneously uh, one or two days later. The hypothesis being that perhaps if we change it frequent enough, um, we might be able to offer the patient a fresh surface for adsorptive clearance of whatever that is uh, making the COVID-19 patients ill in the ICU. So as a balance between the practicality and cost, in order not to disrupt or further burden our ICU nurses' workload, and in order to contain the cost, we decided on the 12-hourly uh, change of auxiliary membrane for five days. Uh, why not four? Why not six? Uh, just an arbitrary number. Uh, I don't have the data with me, but um, of the three patients treated with this frequent filter change approach, with no controls, obviously, um, I think two eventually survived and one uh, succumbed. Uh, and along the way, I think Manish treated one of them with uh, PPE for an acute neuroimmune complication arising from the SARS-CoV uh, infection. So that's, in a nutshell, our experience. And, and all this happened only in April. And after April, I think the sick ones uh, became fewer and fewer. Thank you so much, Prof. I think that's very interesting because uh, you have highlighted, I think, several combinations of uh, using uh, different types of EBCT. How will you decide to choose one over the other? I think one thing you mentioned is about workload. The other thing you were mentioning is about uh, some, some of the evidence behind it. How will you all try to choose one modality over the other? Um, based on what Actually, I... Actually, it's all very uh, practical and complex. Sorry, Prof. Uh, yeah, uh, Prof. Prof. Tan, you, uh, I think Prof. Jarrah Chua was saying. Uh, no, you, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, basically at the point in time in April when we had the, uh, the local search in, in COVID cases and, and we were actually planning for a tsunami or ICU cases uh, nationally, um, we had the opportunity to treat these three patients in, in April at SGH. So, the, the, the other alternative was, was to have used uh, cytosol, but I believe somehow there was uh, some difficulty in bringing it in then in April. And so the only thing we have left of our side of the polymyxin uh, hemoperfusion column, which we have had experience over the last two years, or the auxiliaries. But the problem is that our workhorse is a machine that we all use and, and we love to use, but it's not compatible. It's a closed system and we can't accept a third party device unless you go through the hassle of uh, modifying the connectology, which if, if it could have been done, would have perhaps uh, made the setup uh, perhaps technically um, uh, more challenging. So anyway, we in a nutshell, we chose something that the particular uh, company that supplied the machine also had, and that was the auxiliary membrane. Uh, the only difference was that we use it in an unconventional way, uh, it can be uh, by changing it every 12 hours. Uh, obviously, there's no science to it. It's more dictated by uh, by practical considerations and trying to minimize the, the nurse's workload. Uh, yeah. No, and, and, and actually, there is, because this, I mean, uh, in, in, uh, in addition to this, but though it was not on the, but this particular membrane, there were older studies on the AN69 membrane wherein they, they demonstrated that usually by around 12 hours or so, the adsorptive capacity begins to get saturated, right? So, I mean, of course it was not on this when, but the, the base of this membrane is also the AN69 membrane, right? So, and so I think that, that to, 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 uh, to, to all of us, it kind of made logical sense uh, to, 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 to do it and it would keep the, um, uh, you, you know the absorptive capacity of the membrane at optimal at all throughout the the whole course of the therapy, and like again, at, this was in April when I mean like the, the, one of the participants mentioned that now there is so much more experience and data. But come uh, when it was in April, there was not so much of experience and data, and we we and and, and people were just trying to, to to do it in different ways. 
So we use best the resources we had and uh, with, with this scientific, I mean, uh, with this um, background information, uh, we went ahead to do this. Yeah. Uh, I, I see one of the, the questions posted on the Q&A, uh, the timing of initiation of uh, TPE. Uh, the, the German uh, center, which conducted a pilot study, uh, did it within 12 hours, started within 12 hours of, uh, of recognition of uh, septic shock, right? So um, certainly it has to be done early. Um, if you were to ask me uh, of perhaps the four uh, therapies, right, modalities which the US FDA granted uh, emergency use authorization back in April in the United States, just like us, for probably backs were to the wall. Um, I think uh, the device which stands the best chance of uh, showing a positive signal is the cytosol. Uh, based on, on, uh, on studies pre-COVID and uh, based on the, the enthusiasm of the, you know, the uptake uh, uh, around the world. Uh, I, I think the, the device which stands the lowest chance is the Seraph uh, microbine, because that was a device mainly designed to, to try and bind uh, bacteria Right, and, and then you're ext extrapolating it to to uh, a virus. I think uh, a little bit of a stretch, lah. The 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 spectral apheresis with the plasma with the plasma adsorption. Uh, I th um, the most complex of all the the four modalities, so it may suffer the technical issues, and of course we all know. Uh, based on the CPFA experience uh, in Italy uh, of early deaths, right? So, you know, there, there perhaps is some danger in, in that modality if not executed well, right? So, but, uh, you know, I, I think uh, the, the studies now are ongoing. Uh, the, certainly the, the registries, um, the cytosop registry seems to be the most uh, exuberant. Uh, so, uh, so my, my feeling, it, it, if anything is to come out with a positive signal, it would be the cytosol. I think that's great because uh, you were mentioning that uh, some of them deal with uh, viruses. And then I think the Ephraim studies were all dealing with gram net uh, bacteremias. Mm. So it's a, bit like, it's a bit like personalized medicine. So would you think that the study population itself actually plays a big part to the choice of the EBCT? Yeah, so certainly the... Uh, uh, polymixin B, right, for endotoxin, uh, so that is bacteria and gram uh, spe more specifically. So uh, a virus which is causing havoc for because of a cytokine storm and, uh, and not an endotoxin per se, right, uh, difficult to extrapolate uh, therapies for endotoxemia to, to cytokine storms induced by virus. So, so I think that's why uh, uh, PMX was, was, was not granted. Right? PMX, uh, the Euphrates, the Tigris, they are all based, uh, North American based uh, trials, right? yet uh, the US FDA didn't grant them. So I suspect it's because it's, it, it's too, too deferring uh, uh, patient populations. So, so like, I, I think like what Gerald mentioned and I showed in my slides, right, when you're talking of uh, cartridges or columns which are absorptive, you basically, you, you, you can, they can be in, kind of in a way semi-selective or non-selective to a bit more and like has been highlighted, the polymixin is very specific for endotoxins, though there are some, one or two studies that have mentioned that it does affect the, cy the cytokine level as well, but that is not uh, what it is for and therefore, mm -hmm if you're dealing with a cytokine storm, you know, or, or even a non-infective cytokine storm, like in, in a cardiopulmonary bypass, I mean, bypass or bypass surgery or uh, trauma related, uh, you would need a kind of a more, uh, a, a non-specific cartridge like the science, like a cytokine absorbing cartridge. And in fact, a lot of uh, data out on the use of cytosol in bypass surgery, et cetera, where, where it is used to modulate the cytokines. 
So yeah, but I don't think polymyxin is is the cartridge to use for uh, for COVID. No, I don't. I don't believe so. Definitely. Uh, but so in let's say let's put COVID aside. Let's say we are talking about general uh general patient ICU patients, critically ill patients that we see. Um, some are fungal, uh, fungemia, some are gram neck rot, some are gram positive bacteremia. Do you think they all have, uh, will probably have a similar outcome? Is that what your thoughts are? Or do you think that it still has to be personalized further? So, so like, I think like this, uh, Jerry had highlighted when one, one of, and I think that is one of our major things that the, the ICU population is very heterogeneous and, and they, the, their behavior to different sepsis may be different. And, uh, we and and each of these devices or modalities, uh, each has a certain uh, kind of bias towards removal of certain mediators. Mm -hmm. And I think yes, we will probably need to to try and use the right device for the right patient at the right time of their illness, right? And so, so like you mentioned, if it's a gram-negative uh, thing where the the major uh, uh, kind of uh, the mediator is going to be an endotoxin, I would want to use a device that has probably the highest specificity to endotoxin. And, uh, and studies have shown the amount of endotoxins the polymyxin can remove is high. Though there are, there are other in vitro studies that have compared that maybe in the first couple of hours, the removal by other devices may be similar, but uh, in, the, in the run, that endotoxin is definitely designed for, for, for that, for example. The, the second point would come is where in the trajectory of the illness do we begin to use these devices, mm -hmm. right? Because if our, if our contention is that it is the cytokine or the endotoxin that is going to trigger downstream organ dysfunction, and we, we begin to, to bring these devices into our therapy after the organ dysfunction has already happened, I am not so certain how much we can influence the trajectory of the illness because kind of the damage has been initiated or already done or it is at a reasonably advanced stage. So I think one of the big challenges is, is the timing part. And I think if we look at the, the, the secondary analysis or the ad hoc analysis of the Euphrates trial, it kind of does highlight that you, you want to bring it not too early where you, if you, you, you studied it in a general ICU population in the not so sick, you're probably not going to show any difference because they, their mortality would have been uh, uh, would be low anyway. And in the very, very sick patients where the, the multi-organ failure and damage has already happened where our ability to influence may not be that much. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the things that we probably need to understand and study better and refine in our practice is the right therapy for the right patient at the right time and in mm -hmm. severity. So now whether that right timing can be guided by scores or whether they could be guided by certain um, uh, markers in terms of the levels of, of uh, the mediators, etc., which we know is also again very varied in different people with different severity of illness. So I think that is a part that we may need to to, to try and study better before we we totally uh, you know kind of give up on this this part. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Manish. I, I really like the statement: the right therapy on the right patient at the right time. I think that is uh, excellent mm. advice for all of us. I guess uh, maybe to end uh, to end this session, maybe are there any some parting words or advice about the use of EBCT for our audience? I, I think uh, looking back uh, on the, my my initial uh, enthusiasm with high volume hemofiltration, right the the as what Han Kim describes, the heady days, right? Uh, uh, only to be let down uh, when I've already uh, finally got completed. I think uh, we, we, we need to be cautious in our optimism. Uh, if, if we want to, if we are the, the optimists, we have to be cautious because uh, and, uh, these therapies are not without their dangers in units which do not have vast experience with them, right? And so the learning curve uh, uh, does portend patients to some some risk. So we, we have to be very judicious in in the, the the horses that we want to back. We cannot back a whole fleet, a whole uh, stable of horses. Uh, and don't master anything, uh, and 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 only for 
for everything to fail downstream. Nah. I think that's what I would like to say. Based extrapolating from what how I've seen things evolve over the last 15 years, perhaps. I think car carrying forward, uh, forward on what Gerald mentioned, I think that even our optimism has to be kind of guarded. And, this, uh, and, and I will bring that to the question by Olsen that about some non-selective removal of therapeutic drugs when using adsorption columns. So, so yeah, this is, and I think in infection or in sepsis, antibiotics are, I mean, they are definitely the first line and uh, the most important part. And people have looked at that. So in general, the membranes, uh, like the oxaris, they, they remove hydrophilic antibiotics and the common ones would be the aminoglycosides and vancomycin. So if you have therapeutic drug monitoring and if we are using any one of these therapies, we probably may need to heighten our therapeutic drug monitoring for these antibiotics. Uh, there have been, uh, when it comes to polymyxin, uh, we are fortunate there is not much clearance of antibiotics. People have looked at uh, these uh, various antibiotics in in vitro studies. However, one antibiotic that uh, showed significant uh, removal was actually linozolid, which is a lipophilic antibiotic. So we have to be careful when we are dosing that. Uh, and when it comes to cytosol, uh, like was uh, highlighted earlier in the talk that uh, given the nature of this uh, uh, cartridge, it, it absorbs a lot of uh, antibiotics and especially the lipophilic ones. And uh, again, based on in vitro studies, there was a significant uh, removal of some of these antibiotics, usually within the first 60 to 90 minutes of using the cartridge. And so there are some recommendations that where you have therapeutic drug monitoring, you may want to do it uh, more frequently. And uh, in fact, after starting a cartridge, there may be even a case for topping up a dose of antibiotic within the first one to two hours of initiating the cartridge, because that's where the, the, the absorption is maximum. Right. And uh, based on the in vitro studies, they showed most of antibiotics, apart from the gender, uh, all the lipophilic antibiotics, they absorb almost 90 to 100 uh, percent removal. But of course, these are in vitro studies where you did not have cellular elements. The flow rate was way low, lower than what we would use in the clinical practice, giving much longer time for the interaction with the beads and all that. So yes, so that, that is an important question and something that we need to understand and do further uh, in terms of the drug dosing. Prof Tan, any last words? Yeah, actually my comment is uh, similar to what uh, Gerald has said, and that is that um, it takes at least 20 to 30 years from the time the device uh, has found uh, early promise in the preclinical animal and early clinical uh, studies all the way to the randomized control trial. So it takes about 20 to 30 years for either uh, initial promise to be fulfilled or disappointment to be uh, experienced by all. <laughs> so we need to temper our enthusiasm along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. We are really appreciative of uh, our panelists here. Uh, thank you so much, and we really have learned a lot about EBCT. I think it's an area of uh, that we all should explore a little bit more. And again, I re echo uh, what Dr. Manish had mentioned right therapy, right patient, at the right time. So, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your time. Uh, after this, there will be a lunch symposium by Pfizer. Uh, the link is posted up onto the website as well as to the social media uh, uh, areas. So, please do uh, take time to visit them. If not, thank you and have a nice day.